the beam, because it's time for Nerdy for 30, the podcast where we talk about nerdy-ish movies for 30-ish minutes. My name is Kevin Bauer, aka The Critic's Choice. With me, as always, the people's champ, Tim Keck. And today, we are talking about Scott Pilgrim's newest anime, Scott Pilgrim Takes Off. Kevin, how do you even describe this? Uh, I don't I don't know what to say about this. I It's an anime. It's like a cartoon anime about an alternate reality for Scott Pilgrim, where Scott Pilgrim dies. But really, he is, you know, transported through time. It's time travel, which is which is really good. And uh, his old self pulls him out of the timeline So you just hang out with all these other characters and then, you know, then it ends and everybody's friends. And it's like it's like an alternate reality of what the original Scott Pilgrim movie was about. And um, I guess there were comic books for this, too. I've read I remember reading Scott Pilgrim. I watched the movie and I still needed some reminders with this. Kevin, you're the Scott Pilgrim guy. Yeah. What did you think about this? What did it mean to you to have the gang back together again? They've got the same voice actors <sighs> playing the same roles. They got the band back together. And and what did it do for you, Kevin? All all the pieces were back together, Tim. And I've really thought about this a lot. I mean, I to an embarrassing extent, Scott Pilgrim was part of my identity before this movie came out. And then after it came out, I mean, it was so it was such a big thing for me and all my friends in school. And like I've I've gone to Scott Pilgrim for Halloween. I have had posters like friends of mine from college for my birthday made posters of some of the posters you can see in the background of this thing. I mean, like visually for stuff that I've done in my own projects, I've referred back to work that Edgar Wright and Brian Lee O'Malley have both done. Scott Pilgrim is a huge touchstone for me in no small part because he's a big airhead and I can relate to that. But Tim, this did not hit. And I really, really, really wanted to challenge that because I could feel that a lot of that was the expectations that come from seeing something that you liked adapted into a new medium and we've talked a ton off pod i don't think we've talked about this very much on pod about how i don't really think an adaptation should be exact when you're moving something into another medium like you need to lean into the strengths of that (laughs) medium that's what works so well about the movie versus the comic the spirit was there for sure the tone was there but what edgar wright was doing to it really expanded things in this world uh and like really added to it i think there was a ton of addition that happened in this i think that there was a lot of stuff that uh what studio i think it's like studio saru or like science saru is the name of the animation company behind it um they did another anime that's really great called keep your hands off isaac and and that anime is all about animation so i think what they brought to this from an animation perspective is incredible the sound was incredible but at the end of the day it really it I, it didn't have the same sauce it didn't have the same steam a lot of the humor didn't hit for me that's just my opinion what this was was not for me for the most part how about you how did you feel if it's not for you it's definitely not for me man i don't know i was i was also just thinking more about scott pilgrim and i know how much scott pilgrim means to you mm-hmm. and scott pilgrim was i hate to say this maybe my mission impossible of oh. just I I'm watching it and I'm like, I this should mean more to me than it does. And it never really clicked. And I don't know if that's because it's more of like a a video game culture, Mm -hmm. which doesn't really, really do it for me. I I mean, it's not not shitting on it. Just it's not a world that interests me as much. And so while I think I don't go back and play old games, I don't I just don't I just don't care about that stuff. So when they're bringing that into the real world, it doesn't mean as much to me as, let's say, in Free Guy when he gets Captain America's shield. And then Chris Evans is like, what the fuck? Like that somehow hits harder for me. Sure. That's a great moment. You know, player one level up. Oh, fight time. Like fights. Like, I, I don't I don't know. So I've always liked the first movie. Didn't love it. And then this, I couldn't tell if it was bad or good or it just was it just went in one ear and out the other, man. I could have stopped watching at any point. I could have (laughs) I could have (laughs) I could have finished it if we weren't doing it for the pod. It might have taken me like a few weeks to get through it. Uh, It was just it was a little it was like. 
as interesting as it was, it was equally uninteresting, I think, the whole time. And and it's fine. I mean, I had more fun thinking about the voice actors and them interacting. And they're kind of remixing these characters that weren't really flushed out in the original anyway. Mm -hmm. And they're taking some pretty big leaps and stuff. And they've got some weird message about doing things for yourself, but it still revolves around a boy like this doesn't pass the Bechtel test. And if we're still if we even still think about that, which I guess we don't, but they make a decision as a culture, you and me. <laughs> I think we, we, think we never pass the Bechtel test. We're always talking about <laughs> men and <laughs> we love our guys. And <laughs> so up, up top, they make what I thought was a thief is Scott Pilgrim dies at the beginning. And yeah. in the first episode, I'm like, OK, so it's just Scott Pilgrim. They're just doing Scott Pilgrim again. And then as they go, things are happening a little too fast where I'm like, oh, OK, so this is like this is picking up. Something's coming. And then Scott Pilgrim dies. And I was like, OK, now we're on to something. That's mm-hmm. the end of the first episode. By the end of the second episode, Scott Pilgrim no longer dead. And I'm no longer interested. because. Shifting the focus to Ramona Flowers, who was just a. I don't know, they do they flush her out in the movie, I think I think the I think Scott Pilgrim is good about getting into like the stupidity of like young relationships Mm -hmm. and. You know, the lack of communication (laughs) or otherwise or just being fucking stupid and not knowing what you want and running away from good things and and being messy and. It's it'd be cool to flush out Ramona Flowers and just say, this is her story. This is her thing. She's discovering herself. She's battling her evil exes and make it all about her. And instead, it ultimately comes back to Scott Pilgrim. And I would say a very disappointing way. Yeah, Uh, right there. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Like kind of arc for Scott Pilgrim, I guess. Do you think we could it would have done better if they just focused more on Ramona? Totally. I think that's one of the things, too. I I think I would have I was really trying to shake myself for like how much that was just my expectations being thrown off, too, when I thought this was going to be a straight up adaptation of the comics because the movie is not exact. I mean, the comics weren't even done when the movie happened. So when they announced this, it was like, this feels kind of unnecessary. But to anybody who there are a lot of people who don't like to read manga, they don't like to read comics, but they do like to watch anime. That's fine. So I thought this will be cool. This will be a chance to see the material from the comics get adapted. And I mean, it sounded perfect and the animation was perfect. So I was excited to see that. And then when he died, I was simultaneously excited, like you said, for the narrative possibilities, but then also kind of mourning what looked like it was going to be a perfect adaptation, which Mm. again, like we've seen it a lot. Like even watching that first episode, I felt a little bit bored because I've seen this a lot, but it would have been, I think kind of the most refined version of this thing. So if they'd said instead, if this had been billed as like a Ramona flowers story, if they had focused more in on Ramona, Scott is dead, stays dead. And she is not bizarrely focused on this guy that she had one okay date with i guess there were sparks and that's going to be our justification throughout the rest of the series um yeah i think we get a lot better show i'm interested in that i would love to see multiple seasons of ramona flowers show like this she's a stunt woman now this is cool as shit like there are some really really cool ideas but it's just buried in this really meandering story and i think tim it comes back to one of your big rules there's no stakes there's no stakes in this whole thing because he was dead And at the funeral, they keep the really flippant sense of humor for everyone. So nobody really cares that much that he's dead. They're all there. They're all wearing black, but they're all behaving like they know he's going to come back. But they're not saying they know he's going to come back. I feel like you could have kind of a fun respawn joke there or something. And no, I did think I did think having the coins in the casket was a fucking great a bit. Just wonderful. There's some great bits in this. There really are. There's some really good jokes. There's also a lot of really bad ones. Yeah. Like Scott does a not joke, like very old Scott at the end is like, oh, well, this is great. Not. And it's just like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> like, I know they dug up a lot of 80s video game references. They dig up a couple not jokes as well. <laughs> they just make him into such a loser. And I guess he kind of is a loser. But I mean. 
the the story isn't kind of part of the influence of the Scott Pilgrim thing, like Mario rescuing Peach and like some sort of a disconnect of like, oh, there's this princess, but I don't really have a relationship with the princess. But the whole game is geared around this one MacGuffin. Basically, they're just treating a, a woman like a MacGuffin and like just putting her at the end. And it's just that's the quest. That's the game. That's what you do. And that's how a lot of games are structured and a lot of stories are structured. But you know, I don't know if I buy the idea that they kissed. There were sparks. And now we're going to time travel to the future where they've been together for 30 years. Like kind of I don't need that. I don't mm-hmm. even fucking buy it. I don't necessarily buy that they're going to be together forever. And I don't necessarily think that's the story that Scott Pilgrim tells normally. But now yeah. all of a sudden it's like they're soulmates and they're intertwined. And then something happens. that's so bad that. One Scott's driven insane and comes back and does and the time travel. You know, we just shit on. I just I just shit all over Loki for this time travel stuff. I can't sit here in good consciousness and say, well, you know, it was bad when Loki did it, but Scott Pilgrim really pulled it. I like fuck that. It was bad. It was a bad idea when they first put pen to paper. It's not good. We need to stop time travel stuff. We need to stop <laughs> multidimensional stuff. Stop time travel. I mean, it's Tim, not interesting. I hate to say it's it. jumped the shark a million times. The only way you can stop it is if you go back and prevent it from happening in the first place. Yeah. Just don't watch it. Just don't turn it on. Boycott Loki. Boycott Scott. I mean, why are we doing this? It's so stupid. Like the big bad is Scott in the future because he had a miscommunication with his wife and then went into training for 10 years i mean there is it does it is like a commentary in these kinds of relationships and stuff well i was gonna say do you think it's a commentary on like current culture too like do you think that this is reflective in a lot of ways brian liam alley when the comic came out and edgar wright when the movie came out they were commenting on modern trends so do you think this is brian liam alley taking another chance in 2023 to comment on the fact that time travel is used in this way and multiverses are used like this Maybe, but I mean, is that an original idea at this point? I mean, not necessarily, but I don't think that also necessarily invalidates it all the way. But I do think when we tend to see those things, it's most effective when it is a story that we have seen a million times. We do not need to see Spider-Man's origin story anymore. We do not need to see Batman's origin story anymore. It's done. It's great. You know, cool. Great story. (laughs) We don't need to see it again. Have you ever once in your life wondered what happens to Ramona and Scott after the movie's over? No, I think that's one of the big flaws because I, th- <laughs> I would it. believe that that's they broke the whole up. Question. But also, like, I, I do think that this tried to address some of that insofar as she is not a fleshed out character at all in the original source material. Like this thing no. is it's full of problems. A lot of it is very dated. They directly tried to take a lot of the step head on with like how many times people comment on the fact that Scott's dating a 17 year old. That's gross. But they also like don't change it. Like I noticed the movie. I went back and put the movie on. I noticed the movie changed his age from 23 to 22. So it's a five year age gap between he and knives because that's fine. Apparently. Yeah. Um, really strange call. <laughs> but it's like she's also everybody... 17. It's not an 18 year old in high school. It's not like you're dating a high schooler yeah, who's like... 18. He's dating a high schooler who's 17. Yeah, if you're going to change the age of anybody i mean it's still weird but there and also it's a five-year gap so it was never not weird nowhere you know when you're older a five-year gap whatever once you're in your 20s like who cares but at this point in their lives when the oldest person is 22 it's never not been weird that they're looking up what is some some dude swinging by picking his some high schooler is picking up his elementary school girlfriend <laughs> like that's what they're that's what they're getting across like weird it's fucking weird man Ugh. it's strange I, they try to address a lot of that and i think that's kind of where a lot of the problems come from because we spend a lot of time with the exes who of anybody i think would be the people that i least wanted to spend more time with i would have loved to spend more time with ramona alone i would have spent Spent more time with Julie, spent more time with Kim, spent more time with Stephen Stills and Knives. Instead, we get a lot of time with these exes who were villains originally and are now being framed as just kind of silly guys. And there's a line toward the end where sometimes bad guys can turn into great guys. They also a lot of the time don't like sometimes shitty people are shitty people and they stay shitty people like. It's strange to me that they went so far out of their way 
to pretty much immediately get rid of all the tension, immediately get rid of any of these guys being these toxic creeps that have been stalking Ramona since they dated for, in some cases, decades. And now they just all are kind of dimwits that we get to see a lot of little tiny jokes from. And that's where we're going to go with the series. It, the whole thing just really meandered because it couldn't figure out what it wanted to say about these people or what it wanted to do with them. And I really felt like we were wasting our time here. I think I would have been pumped if they just run the whole thing back, like done basically the Scott Pilgrim movie. But mm. Scott dies and Ramona steps up and fights all these guys. Yeah. And meanwhile, she's coping with her because they're her exes. Exactly. Why does he have to deal with her exes? Exactly. A modern take on it would be her dealing with her past and the fact that she now has to defeat these guys that she ultimately treated poorly. Like her and Scott are shitty people, you know? Yeah. Oh, big time. And. It's and it's a beautiful love story about two shitty people who found each other and have just left a trail of like, you know, misery in their wake. I, that is what is cool about Scott Pilgrim is like Scott is dating a high schooler and then he's playing in a band with like his longest time girlfriend and just completely neglects her the whole time. Also, it was just like dating the most famous woman on the planet uh, and then she destroyed him. And so then now I guess he's dating a. And then he doesn't even talk to this high school girl that he's like spending time with. Uh, it's it's weird. And then all the stuff with Ramona just abandoning everybody. It's it's so messy and kind of fun. And I like that part. But we got distracted with all this ex bullshit. I don't know if I needed yeah. justifications from the exes. I don't think I needed their side of the story. Really? We get no. it. They uh, they wouldn't let anybody in this be a bad person. This was like playing Scott Pilgrim with kid gloves on. You can well, make it better. You can update a lot of stuff, but you can't like, you can't get rid of the tension. Like you got like, it. We can still have the finale. That's a happy ending and have everybody together for this fight scene facing off against future Scott. <clears throat> but we got to earn those people being there. It just felt really unearned. How much of that do you think is the success of the cast? Because to be fair, I think they've all probably peaked before 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, but this cast is stacked. It's crazy. I mean, everyone on here. I mean, I just pulled up like the cast list or whatever. And it's like 10 deep with like people you would recognize or know in real life. And yeah. maybe part of the, you know, maybe if you want May Whitman to be involved, you've got to flush out her character a little bit, you know, or like now Jason Schwartzman is like Schwartzman is like carrying this for some reason. It's. It's it's interesting, but I don't know. That could be. And I would argue that I would rather have the version of the show that is better crafted and better paced and doesn't have the actors from the movie because it was really cool to have them, but I didn't need them. And no. I don't think any of them were exceptionally good voice actors. Um, as great as all of them were in the live action movie, I adore them. I absolutely adore them in the live action movie. It is, it's different. It's a different art form acting with your voice versus acting in person. Yeah. I don't know if there was any voice actors that really stood out to me as like great. I've got you one know? who is my pick for the person that has not peaked yet. Ellen Wong. Every time I watch Scott Pilgrim, I'm like, Ellen Wong, Knives, she's so good. And she does that little, like, anytime she does that little, like, tremor in her voice, like, wow, it's so funny. And it's so, like, well-tuned in. She's she's locked in, man. You're right. She is good. Uh, when you when I pulled up the cast list, she's number one on this list. So really? I was kind of like, she, got, she must be known. She, she she's, like, got first up? billing on Google, which I'm like, there must be more stuff that she's doing that I'm not aware of because she's she's over Michael Sarah and Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Chris Evans, Brie Larson. Oh, wow. She did. She was in Glow, Bestsellers, The Void. I don't know what any of these are. Silent Night, The Carrie. Di I mean, I don't know what it is that she's. That's given Dude, her this bump. The she Carrie was Diaries, in The Void. Maybe? That is a that is a tough movie. Glow. It's got incredible creature effects. Uh, the Void. <laughs> incredible creature effects but like quit man yeah it's it's shot bad i got halfway through and i had to go home uh <laughs> <laughs> what about gosh i was trying to I'm, i i made notes of like beefs and thieves and i've already mm. i've talked about everything i mean i don't even know what else to say about this like I'm, i just 
didn't find this very interesting at all. This whole you thing want me to was pop pretty off? interesting. Pop, I would love for you to pop off. You got to carry this one, Kev, because this is Dude. your passion project. Pop, pop, baby. It's magnitude time. I <laughs> think the sound in this was fucking phenomenal. The animation was great. The sound was unreal. The music they picked, like Anamata Gucci curated this. Also, the circular, like what circularity? Is that even a word? The circular nature of the way that they approached this, bringing in people from different aspects of the Scott Pilgrim past. Anamata Gucci is a chiptune band that did the uh, music for the video game adaptation of the comic that came out at the same time as the movie. So they have <laughs> already done the soundtrack for a Scott Pilgrim property and it's fantastic. It's super good. They are also just a great band in and of themselves. So to have them do the musical direction of this piece, fucking inspired, uh, the opening credits music, wonderful. All of the new sex bob songs, wonderful. They fit right in. The fact that they got those people to do the voices for it again. Awesome. It are those like all new songs? Something. The only, uh, yeah, I think they're all new. I don't think they don't did they any that, of the old ones in the music. Didn't they do one of the old ones like at the concert or something? No, they did. That was a brand new one at the concert. And I feel fine is a new one, but I feel fine is also, it's an inversion of um, We Are Sex bob So like, uh, We Are Sex bob it's and I feel fine goes so it's oh, kind of like a cool. fun inversion of the thing. Yeah. Uh, metric. So I loved this move from the movie where if you're going to have a band in a movie that has like a hit single, unless you've got just an absolute dinger in your pocket. I love the move of taking an existing really good single from an indie band that a lot of people haven't heard of and just having that be the song in the movie, the princess diaries did it with the band Rooney, which is one of my favorite bands. And they had the yeah. lead singer Rooney. There is the guy. Um, they used the song by the band metric, but they had Brie Larson sing it because she's in V Adams in the movie. And then uh, Brie Larson didn't do the vocals for this. So when they did that cover of, I will remember you, it was metric just with the original metric lead singer. Like that kind of oh, stuff wow. is all so cool. The way they brought it all back, the sound effects for the little motions, everybody does like it sounded almost like um, animal crossing sound effects. Anytime anybody like blinked or moved their feet or anything like that. It's, it's just really, really cool. It is so cool and it makes it weird. I mean, you know, I'm a story guy. You like all these details. It's mm. wild to me when people make these big projects and it's clearly people who are passionate about this stuff. They mm. get the people, the right people involved. It looks good. I don't know if it looks great for what I want to see from like an anime fighting standpoint, but I think it looks cool and unique and feels like Scott Pilgrim and the music. It sounds great. And then the story is just like completely fucked. It's so weird when everything like the packet, it's like getting a beautifully wrapped Christmas present. Yeah. And then you open it up and it's just, you know, a calculator for the fourth year in a row. <laughs> and you're like, I don't need this. It's a it's a pocket. But your grandma, you know, she doesn't remember things very well. And she just keeps getting you calculators because she remembers you, you did bad at math. In college, you brought, it was your one B in elementary school. And so now she just gives you calculators all the time. And if, if she has a phone. She doesn't know how to use it. She doesn't realize it's a calculator as well. And, you know, and then you just look at your family and you laugh and you smile and you try and pretend <laughs> it's OK. And that's what Scott Pilgrim reminds me of <laughs> this. A beautiful package that we all have to tell ourselves is OK. Yeah. You know what it reminded me of is across the Spider-Verse. That's I was just going to say that oh, you read my, my mind. Man. Same exact thing. Yeah. Same exact thing. For this, everything aligned perfectly. I should have loved this. They even brought in Will Forte. My hero, Will Forte. <laughs> Your hero, Will Forte? I love Will Forte. Too. <laughs> I didn't know about this. Will Forte is a massive, massive influence on any comedy I've ever done. God, the last man on earth. I should have seen it from a mile away. That's the guy. He's yeah, funny, man. but isn't is Mary Elizabeth Winstead doing the same voice for older Ramona? I think so. Yeah. So then why is older... 
it was an interesting choice, I thought, to give older Scott a different voice actor. And like a very different voice actor. I very love Will. Different. He did not match up very well. No. I think I would have preferred for it to be Michael Sarah still. As much as I love the forte. Me too. I mean, if he was a separate villainous character or something, mm-hmm. that would have been something. So the future, the future world made no sense to me. Right. Yeah. Like they get to the future and Ed, there's grass is overgrowing everything. And then they're in nice homes and there's like no war that's going on. Like nothing happened. There's no fighting. There's they could just still use the playground if they wanted. But for some reason, they're locked inside and <laughs> they're doing using nothing. like breathing masks, it. too. There was were something they wearing there. breathing masks. Yeah, they were wearing like everybody's wearing like really high tech breathing masks when they were outside in the bus. When they got on the bus, there was some sort of like an intense jet blast of air for scott to get on the hover bus so something seems like it's going on yes there's some sort of a virus that justifies it i guess but i don't know it just seemed like generic space world that (laughs) generic future world that was like fine all right i guess it's cool they don't address it but dude we were talking about this lauren and i were talking about this when the planet of the apes trailer came up this past weekend uh did you so i think overgrown post-apocalyptic cities are going to be what people identify with this time period. The same way that for the 80s, you know, it's like sunglasses and that kind of like neon font, and like a grid background and Terminators and like warehouses, like that whole like warehouses at night. That's like an 80s movie staple. Um, that for the 2020s, it's going to be overgrown apoc- apocalyptic scenarios. You think people, you know, 100 years from now, we're going to look back and 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 check out our obsession with this overgrown alternative future, yeah. like, you know, Walking Dead, like. Other movies <laughs> that have done this, it does feel like a thing. I mean, it is like, oh, everything goes to shit. Our society, our society collapses and mm-hmm. then nature comes back and nature revives itself. Yeah. And it is weird that we've all just we've all just decided that's what the future is. Oh, for is, sure. <laughs> we all get the, eliminated and then nature, the planet takes over again and we're we're exterminated like that. It's it is interesting. Yeah, it's weird that that's the specific vibe for this. The first to go, movie making. the first to go will be the groundkeepers. We didn't know it, but they were the first line of defense. <laughs> <laughs> There's no point in mowing your lawn if a zombie's going to run through it, you know? Mm-mm. Mess it all up. Gosh, we just couldn't get there with like the Roomba version of a lawnmower. Just barely (laughs) just couldn't quite get there before the robot apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully before the the, like the robot apocalypse, we get robot maids like working. Right. You know, like we we need to figure out how to survive. Yeah, sure. Yeah. One that like doesn't need the Internet, just runs on solar power. No, disconnected. can't be influenced by the robots. Oh, my God. Just does its job. If this thing discovers the Internet, fuck, if the if the Jetsons made I want to see a post apocalyptic Jetsons where the premise is that the Jetsons made found the Internet. This just feels like a Black Mirror episode at this point. Could be. Wait, they discover the Internet like they what if it's a robot cut off from the Internet and then their eyes are open. Now now you can have like a, a robot messiah who is connecting severed robots to the Internet. Oh, my God. It's the one that happened to guess the Wi-Fi password. So it's the only one that has access. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only one that had the code. Or you know what? The Wi-Fi password is like written on the back of his neck or something. Oh, my God. Because somebody wrote it <laughs> on and it my to printer, remind him. My printer's got one right on the back. Oh, my printer can't see great. it. But if mirrors oh, were positioned right. Uh, I feel like I saw some anime thing where it was like that, where it's like, oh, you can't look at the back. Oh, it's like then they're running society and it's like you can't look at the back of their you can't look at their back. You'll see the the tattoo and the ancient scriptures written there and then they just have long hair to cover it. And then it just reveals to be the Wi-Fi password. Gosh, this could be a script. <laughs> Robot Messiah is a comic that's coming out from us. Nerdy for mm-hmm. 30. Yeah. Uh, in how long do we need for this? 2023. We can get it done this year. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if they threw this Scott Pilgrim thing together in a couple months, we can do this. <laughs> it's going to be a comic that comes out this year. And then about 20 years from now, it's going to be a Netflix adaptation that is OK. 
I'm reading uh, the NMCU book right now by uh, one of the, the some of the ringer people. Oh, yeah. Joanna Robinson's talking about, book. Yes. Yes. And they're talking about the history of the MCU. And, I, and I've barely made a dent in it, but they were already talking about the success of Iron Man and how they fought. They like followed it up with Iron Man 2. And it's all the stuff I always thought of with like stand up comics, too, where like, you know, Ron White puts out an album and a special and it's awesome. He's crushing. And it's like, oh, that crushed because it's 10 years worth of work and energy and effort that he put into on the road. Like he put time and passion into that and then it does well. And then Comedy Central's like, hey, can you do another one in two years or six months? I think he had one that was like in a year or something crazy short. And he's like, sure, I have to because of all this money. But then it's just not it can't be as good because you sure. haven't spent that much time on it. And apparently the same thing happened with Iron Man 2, where they were like, OK, Iron Man 2 is coming out in two years and they hadn't even signed on Favreau or Downey yet. And then they closed the deal with them. And Favreau was just stressed out of his mind for two years, cramming in Iron Man 2. And then he's just never done another MCU thing because he's like, I can't I can't take this. this is too much. Iron Man was like a passion project, you know, for the first one. And then the second one, it was just too it was too much going on in too short a period of time. And you know, it felt a little rushed. And I think you can kind of see that on screen in Iron Man 2. Wow. Uh, I like so Iron it's Man interesting too, to me when it's like this Scott Pilgrim thing. Does this feel similarly rushed? I think that works for like that across the Spider-Verse, right? Where we're talking about yeah. that. There's something about that that feels rushed. Uh, and this Scott Pilgrim thing, I'm wondering if it feels kind of rushed from like a, a writing standpoint, but also I don't think there was a rush for this movie. Right? Like this was the kind of thing that had no timeline. Nobody needed this. So why does it feel <laughs> rushed? Why not take another year and like write a good script? I don't know. It's I, I just wonder how much of that other stuff came into it because there's yeah. so many things that happen behind the scenes with all these movies where we're like, you know, they're cramming it in. They don't have time. It's like SNL. We're like SNL sucks. But like that's because they're like trying to do it all in a week. And, you know, they just that's part of the charm. Part of the charm is that SNL isn't good because it's so rushed. You know, they could like just take the summer and write and make something of quality. But that's not the premise. That's not the show, you know. Mm -hmm. And I guess Scott Pilgrim is, is the SNL of animes. I don't know. I guess I just wanted to brag that I was reading a book. Sure, dude. <laughs> Want to work that in there. Noted. <laughs> uh, I think so. Uh, I do think that uh, SNL has been really good this season. And I also think that uh, a lot of this is Brian Lee O'Malley because he wrote the series in addition to the comic. I mean, he he wrote this. He's a credited writer on every single every single episode. Uh, I think a lot of the content in this is him grappling with this thing that brought him to fame. And there's so much talk in the piece about adaptation and of grappling with things that you did in your past. And I think that a lot of things he changed about the characters and things that made the characters bad people are things that he has some regrets around, but that's also part of making the work. Being a perfect person is not part of what makes your art interesting. So it's tough. I, I recognize, obviously, this is like a valid artistic expression from him reflecting on his past. Um, I think your Ron White comparison is apt because I think there is a there's a hunger. There's an electricity. There's an energy in making something when you have no pressure on you because nobody's looking at you and you're just hungry to do something to prove yourself and break through. And then once you've already done it, it's the struggle that so many people who find huge success face which is what do you do now like what do you do when your reality doesn't look like the reality of all the people that you are creating art for anymore hmm. you become jay-z and you put out albums in the guggenheim and that's what you do but what do you do listener <laughs> let us know nerdy430 at gmail.com thank you so much for listening we'll be back here again next week with an episode on Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. You're not going to want to miss this one. It's on Netflix. Oh, Check boy. it out. We'll see you then. Till then, stay nerdy, everybody. Stay nerdy. Bye. Bye. I don't know. If I'd ever put out an album with Linkin Park, I think I'd coast after that. <laughs> <laughs> you could argue he did. <laughs> I think he did. <laughs>